Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère revoir un latte. It's been fairly quiet, at least on Christmas Day. But as you've seen, the president's been tweeting about the FBI. He's been tweeting about his deputy director, Andrew McCabe. Why is that the right message right now for Donald Trump and Republicans? Well, you know, there's two two issues here. First of all, yes, the president does have his own unique communication style, which I don't think any of us have seen the use of Twitter deployed so broadly as the president does. But on the investigation, uh, that investigation is totally off the rails, and 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 I'm really concerned. But he's not tweeting about the, the investigation. He's, but he's tweeting about his deputy director. He's tweeting about FBI agents, Congressman. Yeah. Do you think that's appropriate yeah, sure. for the I, president? I'm 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 very concerned that that the DOJ and the FBI. Uh, whether you want to call it deep state or what, are kind of off the rails. When you look at what that Strozik guy was texting, you look at what that uh, Orr guy talking to the uh, dossier uh, op- uh, Clinton op research people, and then this McCabe guy's wife takes six hundred thousand dollars from uh, Clinton related sources while while he's while she's running for state senator. But Congressman, you just called the FBI and the DOJ off the rails. Fundamentally, how is that something that you're okay with talking? How does that not sort of undermine the work that these agencies are doing? I think the American people have have very high standards for our government agencies, and to see people like these uh, are those agencies not uh, living up to examples, those standards. Well, those aforementioned examples are really, really nerve-wracking to me, and undermine my confidence that the agencies uh, don't respect the Constitution and will will not put the ends before the means. That's a pretty broad brush you're painting with. Yeah, but we've seen a lot of uh, ends before the means culture, both out of the Obama administration, out of Hillary Clinton, you know, with her eighty-four million dollars of potentially illegal campaign contributions, or the Clinton Foundation uranium uh, one. Uh, we've got a people. People need a good, clean government. Do you think people don't have a good, clean government? Because Congressman, I got to let you go. But I guess the point I'm trying to get at: there are those who look at comments like the ones that you're making and say Republicans are working to essentially try to discredit the Department of Justice and thus discredit the Russia investigations. Is that not what you're doing? No, I don't want to discredit them. I just I would like to see the the directors of those agencies purge it and say, look, we've got a lot of great agents, a lot of great lawyers here. Those are the people that I want the American people to see and know the good work's being done. Not these people who are kind of the deep state. Language like that, Congressman, purge, purge the Department of Justice. Well, I I think the, that Mr. Strozik could be purged. Sure. Uh, Congressman Francis Rooney, we'll have to leave it there. It is Wednesday, December 27th of 2017, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special today, of course, is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. That's right. You can uh, attach any meaning that you want to it. Well, the clip uh, that we started off the show with is, of course, uh, Florida GOP Representative Francis Rooney. Uh, basically being a useful idiot, at least. I keep saying, and I have said from even before the election, follow the rubles. And uh, also, in tandem to following the rubles, follow the dead bodies. And and there will be some injured ones, too. Um, put those two together, and it's almost like a divining rod. 
quivers here, quivers there. Next thing you know, you've got a gusher. <laughs> That's right, no brag, just fact. Well, uh, some sad news, actually, I want to get uh, attended to here. Um, it seems that the son of former Washington Post publisher Catherine Graham, William Graham, on December 20th committed suicide. And uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, apparently uh, this is, you know, his dad, Philip, committed suicide uh, a little more than 50 years ago. Uh, oh, uh, Catherine Graham. Uh, she became, well, both Philip and Catherine were the publishers of the Washington Post. And after Philip's suicide, after spending six weeks in a psychiatric hospital, I guess that helped, um, <clears throat> she took over the reins of uh, the Washington Post. And uh, some people within the organization felt that maybe she might not be up to the task. And indeed she was. But uh, William had been uh, teaching at the trial law at the University of California at UCLA, or at Los Angeles, otherwise known as UCLA. And uh, he had worked at the Post for quite a bit. Uh, age 69, uh, brothers uh, said that he had been suffering from a, a heart ailment for years that was painful and debilitating. Uh, just sad news. Um, I became a a Catherine Graham fan. I, you know, I mean, come on. She was part of the DC, you know, uh, uh, cocktail circuit, I think is what they called it back in the day. And, uh, but, uh, her, her bravery in, uh, publishing the Pentagon papers and then taking on Watergate, uh, is, is one of the admirable historical moments in U S history. And they were on the right side of history. Uh, interesting that the same uh, group who fought against uh, Daniel Ellsberg and uh, and then the rest of America, too. Of course, they were fighting against America with the secret Pentagon Papers. Uh, that same group is in Trump's orbit right now. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, well, uh, it's it's sort of, I, I've maintained a lot of this is get back for Watergate, but it is also deeper than that now because of the geopolitics involved. Well, let's take a quick look about what we will be attending to today in the uh, front cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, we're going to examine the lawsuit filed by eight northeastern states against the EPA over air pollution from the Midwest. Hmm. Uh, sort of harkens from the Dust Bowl. New York, Philadelphia, and San Francisco have filed suit against the Pentagon over gun background checks. And a new investigative report reveals a major cover-up and corruption in the Las Vegas Police Department before and after the mass shooting there on 1 October. Then after the break, we move to the chef's table and we're going to have a discussion on how the Republican tax scam opens a back door for federally funded school vouchers and in proof, further proof he learned American civics from Kremlin backed assets. Trump blames Jeff Sessions for the recent Alabama Senate seat loss. Why? Because Sessions quit to become attorney general. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Okay, now that we're settled in here in the front cafe, why don't we start off with this first item off of today's menu, uh, by uh, penned by Peter Zakelli from Reuters. Eight northeastern states said they sued the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to force it to impose more stringent controls on a group of mostly Midwestern states whose air pollution they claim is being blown in their direction. In the latest development of a legal saga that began during Barack Obama's presidency, the lawsuit by New York and seven other states challenges a Trump administration decision to allow nine upwind states to escape tighter smog pollution controls. 
Millions of New Yorkers are breathing unhealthy air as smog pollution continues to pour in from other states, said New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, who led the coalition of states that filed the lawsuit dated Friday. Christmas Eve. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Christmas weekend. Uh, the coalition urged the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia to overturn the EPA's decision. Not to add the nine upwind states to the congressionally created ozone transport region, which requires stricter pollution controls. And of course, an EPA spokeswoman declined to comment because Scott Pruitt runs a tight ship. Yes, he does. Northeast and mid-Atlantic states have long contended that emissions from coal-fired power plants and other air pollution in the Midwest is carried eastward by prevailing air currents. In a statement, Schneiderman said the EPA was empowered to add states to the ozone transport region if the EPA has reason to believe that their air pollution is significantly causes states already in the region to exceed federal pollution standards. Now, the lawsuit was filed by the Attorneys General of Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont, which in late 2013 originally asked to have nine upwind states added to the ozone transport region. I call it the smog belt. The case resulted in a consent decree that forced the EPA to decide by the end of October 2017 whether to to add Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia to the region. Of course, Scott Pruitt re declined to add the states because, you know, uh, <laughs> they are in the air pollution business. Schneiderman said the EPA's own sto studies show that pollution from upwind states substantially adds to harmful levels of smog in New York and cited an American Lung Association report showing that the New York City area ranks as the nation's ninth most smog-polluted city. Now, there is precedent of something on this scale occurring before, and that was the Dust Bowl, in which massive amounts of topsoil were uh, uh, rendered airborne and flew, flew, flew in the jet stream, which no one knew existed at the time, and made its way to New York and elsewhere and covered the eastern seaboard with Midwestern Oklahoma and other states' topsoil. So what happens when you turn something into, you know, sort of a gas like smoke? that will blow, blow, blow on the prevailing winds. And where does it go, go, go? Yeah. Uh, in my younger days, I sat on the Orange County, California Air Quality Management Board. And uh, uh, it, it, it's not just one town in Orange County that needs to get their air pollution act together. And then another town does theirs. It's a regional thing. Air doesn't really adhere to human-imposed boundaries. It just go, go, goes. And, um, well, even then, there was kickback from uh, the oil industry at the time because that, uh, Southern California is one giant oil field. There's oil derricks everywhere. Everywhere, even off Malibu. And, um, uh, yeah, they didn't want a regional... Uh, attention to air quality because it would mean that then they would have to well learn how to not learn how to not pollute but i'll i'll give it to them they did learn and they still know how not to pollute in spite of what scott pruitt says next course up here in the front cafe uh in west coast cookbook and speakeasy now i don't often source from politico but uh, today I did, so sue me, okay? All right, uh, this is by Brian Bender from Politico. The cities of New York, Philadelphia, and San Francisco have filed suit against the Pentagon for repeatedly failing to report military convictions to a federal database designed to keep firearms out of the hands of criminals. 
The lawsuit was filed in federal district court in Virginia on Friday in cooperation with former Arizona Democratic Congresswoman and shooting victim Gabby Gifford's gun control advocacy group. The cities are seeking a court order to monitor, monitor compliance with reporting requirements that the Pentagon in recent weeks has acknowledged it has failed to comply with for years. Two separate military investigations, one by the Air Force and one by the Department of Defense Inspector General, recently found the failure to share the data is systemic across the military branches, in some cases a full third of the time. The reviews were undertaken in November after a former airman, David Kelly, shot to death 26 people, including an unborn baby, in a Texas church. Leave it to Politico to put in the angel babies in there, too. Not, you know, I mean, it's, I understand it's tragic and should not have happened. And I don't want to use uh, an unborn child in my, uh, well, I guess I already have. The complaint states that 26 innocent people were murdered and 20 others wounded in a Texas church in a mass shooting that could and should have been prevented. Had defendants simply followed the law, that shooter never should have been able to purchase the weapon he used. No new laws are required to achieve that goal. Instead, this court need only grant plaintiff's request to compel defendants to diligently implement and consistently apply the unambiguous laws that have been on the books for decades. Now, I'm all for this. Okay. Now, my fear is of what will happen in this court case is what usually happens, even though these are uh, cities of quite long standing in the United States, they probably won't have standing in the court. Oh, you don't have standing to sue. Oh, you would like the U.S. government to uh, uh, start a ethics investigation into the Trump administration because of uh, the violation of the Emoluments Clause? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have standing. You, you, Somebody who has actually been injured needs to come and bring this court case, bear all the costs. That one person. Not, not a bunch of people represented by crew, for instance. Or not cities. Cities don't have standing. Not now. The group complains the GOP Congress, which is considering legislation to address the problem, problem in the form of the proposed Fix Dix Act, has dragged its feet. Really? This is why we're now going to the courts. After 20 years of failure, outside monitoring by the courts is clearly necessary to guarantee that the reporting failures that led to the Texas church shooting should never happen again. The lawsuits summed up. Okay. But once again, uh, I, the guy did have some legally, uh, so, uh, quote, quote, legally purchased uh, gun, guns, but the ones he used, he, he built. And uh, pretty much online stuff, Can, you know. So uh, Bobby Kennedy went to Roseburg, Oregon and got booed off the stage when he was uh, uh, advocating to, to not have mail order guns anymore. People in Roseburg. But there are a bunch of white nationalists there anyway. Okay, last course here at the Front Cafe at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Liz Posner out of Alternet. Now, I uh, need to disclose uh, right off the top that um, uh, now this is the uh, story about um, the mass shooting in Las Vegas on October 1st. And uh, my brother, the actor Jerome Hamilton, uh, was in what uh, many call the kill zone. And uh, so I should put that up front. He is also uh, the administrator of the um, official Route 91 Survivors Support Group. So uh, uh, though he and I have uh, you know, widely divergent political opinions and should I say capacity? Um, <laughs> he's my brother, and I don't like my brother being shot at. So it kind of sucks. 
Uh, he used to be a cop, so he he, he kind of knew what the sounds were and reacted accordingly. Uh, not by drawing guns, because he wasn't a cop then. Okay, He was there to enjoy uh, country music. Country strong. Okay, so uh, many of the deaths could have been avoided, but according to this uh, uh, investigative report, the police and uh, Mandalay Bay want to hide the truth. Unanswered questions still surround the mass shooting in Las Vegas of October 1st of this year, days after shooter Stephen Paddock killed 59 people and injured over 500. Confusing details emerged. Journalists sparred with police at press conferences, grappling for missing details. The security guard who discovered Paddock in his hotel room with 24 guns was shot by Paddock, then later disappeared, only to reemerge as a guest on the Ellen DeGeneres show. To shed light on this confusion, a new documentary film and an investigative journalist report called What Happened in Vegas explores the role of the Las Vegas Police Department after the mass shooting. In short, there is plenty of evidence to suggest cover-ups and corruption as well as repeated police brutality within the force. Well, anybody who knows the Las Vegas Police Department is aware of this. We've had many stories coming out of the Las Vegas Police uh, Department for any number of uh, questionable police tactics, uh, shall we say. At the root of the problem, uh, the report explains, is that the Las Vegas Police Department is run by a sheriff elected in large part by no donations from MGM, the corporation that runs the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Oh, or are they just the front group and it's the mob that's running it? You can never tell anymore. According to the documentary, Los Angeles, or I mean, sorry, Las Vegas police changed their story multiple times on the timeline of the shooting. I, I need to interject again one more time. I apologize. But this is the, um, uh, what I hear from the survivors of this horrific act is that in these people's attempt to deal with the trauma, the, you know, because some of them had, you know, were not only shot or even I got to say, even if you're not shot, being in, in essentially a war zone has long lasting traumatic effects. All right. And some people are just there to have a good time dressed, you know, not, not for war, but for a hot night. You know, do some line dancing. You know, that's what they're there for, not to get shot at. They weren't prepared for that. And so there's any number of wild, crazy-ass conspiracy theories emanating from this act and out of this particular group. And some of them are having a hard time dealing with it. There are some who doubted Sandy Hook, who now have to wonder about their worldview. And it was a traumatic event that caused them to have that dissonance in which they had to question their worldview. I guess that's good in one way. But then when they get the confusion from from the authorities, then it just causes the conspiracy speculation to, to run rampant. Now, I only look at the this group's uh, postings and, and whatnot from various places. I don't engage. It's not my place. But that is one of the major complaints is that could they just get the story straight? And I will say people within the midst of it in in the moment that this is happening, you think you know what the truth is. I've been there before. You think you know where the gunfire is coming. You think that it's multiple gunmen. And it could very well be. You got to be, be prepared for that. But I've been in that part of Vegas. There's so much echoing off those giant buildings over huge amount of spaces. The amount of traffic noise that emanates out of there is is quite amazing. And it's all re- it, it it echoes and resonates off the hard surfaces of these buildings. You get a sharp report of a gun. 
it's going to echo several times off various buildings and people down there in what was known as the kill zone. They hear gunfire coming from every which way. And that's what they remember. Okay, one important detail the police lied about in several instances is the timing of Paddock's shooting a security guard, Jesus Campos. Why? It's likely that the LVPD wanted to help the casino's legal case, and if they claimed Campos was killed while trying to prevent Paddock's rampage as opposed to during or after, it could help the casino's lawyers later claim that the Mandalay Bay had sufficient action to stop him. At least seven news organizations have since sued the LVPD for failing to release all the information from the night of the shooting. Now, the Zanzu Campos wasn't killed. He survived the gunshot wound, I believe, because he went on Ellen DeGeneres. Okay, the documentary also suggests that if the police and casino had acted differently, the mass shooting might have been avoided. And uh, a little known piece of the story of what happened in Las Vegas earlier this year is revealed in the documentary. As Stephen Stubbs, an attorney working on behalf of the victims, explains, casinos like the Mandalay Bay have a special back number to a private wing of the police department, which they use to alert the police of possible criminal activity within their casinos involving high rollers. Because you don't want the cops coming in through the front door. And you don't want just anybody calling 911 out on the gaming at the gaming tables. You have a hotline to the cops. And they come through the back door. Actually, they're tunnels. Get in the elevator. You're up wherever you're supposed to go. So uh, Paddock was a regular at the casino and known to be a high roller by the hotel staff. So the Mandalay Bay didn't call 911 when Paddock shot Campos. They called the back line instead, and the operator did not link the shooting of Campos to this cascade of bullets pouring out of Paddock's hotel window onto the Route 91 Music Festival. If they would have called 911, the 911 operator could have linked the two quicker and And the police would have gotten there quicker. Less people would have died. Less people would have been shot, the lawyer said, if the Mandalay Bay did not treat their high rollers differently. And if the LVPD did not allow casinos to treat high rollers differently. This is the truth that Sheriff Joe Lombardo does not want to come out. As for the still unanswered question of why Paddock chose to murder so many people that day, Stubbs has a theory. From what I understand, Paddock did this because he wanted to hurt those casinos financially, and this was the best way he knew how. But culpability still points to the corrupt special relationship between the MGM and the Las Vegas Police Department. It did not have to be this bad if they would have treated him like anyone else. Um, Maybe just to be devil's advocate... Uh, It's always easy to be the Monday morning quarterback, you know, and uh, so I don't know, maybe calling the back line meant that, yeah, you know, treat our high rollers differently. But when you have had a guard shot, hmm, it's just interesting. Well. Uh, I guess when when you're taught to call through the back line and that's what you're supposed to do, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Maybe, I guess, at this point, uh, protocols need to be changed within the department. Uh, the documentary uh, explores numerous instances of police mo- misconduct and several incidents in which police needlessly shot and killed suspect. There's the story of Trevin Cole, who'd been selling small amounts of pot on the, on the side and whose wife was several months pregnant when he was shot and killed by a police officer. The police secured a warrant for his arrest. In reality, they lied to the judge and provided evidence against an entirely different man named Trevin Cole. And an officer went to his apartment and shot him in the head. When the police department was criticized for Cole's death, they launched a smear campaign that tried to promote the false image of Cole as a dangerous drug dealer. Except... 
He wasn't. It's a tactic the Las Vegas police often resort to. Often a dead person is vilified and they release negative details to the media. I wouldn't say that's endemic to just the Las Vegas Police Department. In fact, you almost think like they're taught it all over by roving uh, uh, cop trainers. Hired privately to come and train them. Uh, Let's see. Uh, They tried to turn my son into some kind of druggie. Eric was a West Point grad. He was very effective and popular platoon leader. And he apparently wasn't selling pot on the side. They got the wrong Trevin Cole. Of the high-profile police shootings in Las Vegas in recent years, the Coles family's attorney says all three situations could have been avoided if the LVPD de-escalated the situations instead of escalating them. Well, that's a tragedy all the way around, and uh, we we can draw complaints about uh, any number of actions that should have been taken that weren't. But in the stressful situation, I guess you fall back on your training. And if everybody was trained to call the back line, I guess there needs to be some new training, doesn't there? Okay, well, we better get to our break now, and then we'll come back uh, and move everything to uh, the chef's table for uh, a more intimate and involved discussion. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This special day got me to thinking about America's spirit of giving. And I don't mean this overdone business of Christmas gifts. I mean our true spirit of giving, giving of ourselves. Yes, we are a country of rugged individualists, yet there's also a deep, community-minded streak in each of us. We're a people who believe in the notion that we're all in this together, that we can make our individual lives better by contributing to the common good. The establishment media pays little attention to grassroots generosity, focusing instead on the occasional showy donation by what it calls philanthropists, big tycoons who give a little piece of their billions to some university or museum in exchange for getting a building named after them. But in my mind, the real philanthropists are the millions of you ordinary folks who have precious little money to give, but consistently give of yourselves and do it without demanding that your name be engraved on a granite wall. My own daddy, rest his soul, was a fine example of this. With half a dozen other guys in Denison, Texas, he started the Little League Baseball program, volunteering to build the park, sponsor and coach the teams, run the squawking PA system, etc., etc., Even after I graduated from Little League, Daddy stayed working at it because his involvement was not merely for his kids, but for all. He felt the same way about being taxed to build a public library in town. I don't recall him ever going in that building, much less checking out a book, but he wanted it to be there for the community, and he was happy to pay his part. Not that he was a do-good liberal, for God's sake. Indeed, he called himself a conservative. This is Jim Hightower saying, My daddy didn't even know he had a political philosophy, but he did, and it's the best I've ever heard. He would often say to me, Everybody does better when everybody does better. If only our national leaders in Washington and on Wall Street would begin practicing this true American philosophy. If you like these feisty pops of populism that Hightower zings out on the airwaves, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter provides the in-depth lowdown on what the greed heads of Wall Street and the bone heads of Washington are doing to us behind the scenes. With Hightower's saucy Texas humor and truth-telling populist perspective, the lowdown literally can lift you up. And get this, you can have the lowdown delivered to your mailbox or email each month for only $15 a year. Yes, 12 issues, only 15 bucks. Check it out, HightowerLowdown.org. This is 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Congress is divided into two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. This arrangement is a check on the power of Congress to pass laws. For example, when the House of Representatives passes a bill, it must be sent to the Senate. 
The bill must also pass the Senate by a majority vote before it can become law. The executive and judicial branches also have checks or controls on Congress. If a bill passes in both houses of Congress, the bill must be sent to the president for approval and signature. When the president signs the bill, it becomes a law. The president may refuse to sign a bill and send it back to Congress. This is the president's power to veto a bill passed in Congress. When the president vetoes a bill, the bill can only become law if approved by a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. The U.S. Supreme Court has the power to declare a law made by Congress unconstitutional. The court may say that the Constitution does not give Congress the right to pass such a law. In this case, the law can no longer be carried out or enforced. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Julia Rosen. Got a minute? You know those nutrition guidelines the government issues every few years? It turns out that following them isn't just good for your health; it's good for the planet too. What we found is that、uh, impacts vary、uh, across nations, but in high-impact nations, in general,、uh, you can see that if you follow a re- nationally recommended diet, despite the fact that these diets don't mention explicitly, or most of them don't explicitly mention、uh, environmental impacts, that、um, you are going to have lower environmental impacts due to that. Um, so that's sort of fairly clear across、uh, all the high-income nations. Paul Barens, an environmental scientist at Leiden University in the Netherlands, the food we eat takes a big toll on the environment. A third of the ice-free land on Earth is used for agriculture, and according to some estimates, producing food accounts for roughly a fifth of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. Fertilizer runoff also leads to other problems, like the algae blooms in Lake Erie and the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. However, following dietary guidelines would reduce those impacts, especially in wealthy countries like the U.S. And most of the reductions、uh, come from meat and dairy, which have an outsized impact on land use and pollution, and are a major source of greenhouse gases. That's partly due to cow farts. Seriously. Heating recommendations would also mean eating fewer calories, since many people here eat more than they need. Overall, in high-income countries, Barron's team estimates that following the rules could result in as much as a 17% reduction in land use, a 21% reduction in nutrient pollution, and a 25% drop in agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Cutting down on how much food we waste, which is roughly a third in the U.S., could help even more. The results are in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Of course, people are notoriously bad at following diets, but these nationally recommended guidelines do actually have a big knock-on effect to other、uh, areas of policy making. So, if I'm developing a new healthy eating for schools program, then that's going to be based off a lot of detail that I get from the nationally recommended guidelines. So, while it might not necessarily be the case that you know people follow directly, they actually are quite influential on the preparation of other advice. Seems that a smaller environmental footprint and a healthier lifestyle could go hand in hand. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. From United Nations headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas. With a selection of the day's top world news headlines. The United States is throwing a party. It's been labeled a friendship reception and will be held on January 3rd in New York. The guest list: to get an invite, you needed to either vote with the U.S., abstain, or sit out a U.N. resolution on Thursday that condemned President Trump's Jerusalem announcement. A total of 64 countries will get an invite. By contrast, 128 countries voted against the United States on Thursday. The U.S. has a new ambassador to the Vatican, Callista Gingrich, wife of the former Republican Speaker of the House and presidential hopeful Newt Gingrich. In a video message last month, Gingrich touted the things the U.S. and the Vatican had in common: defending human rights, advancing religious freedom, combating human trafficking, and seeking peaceful solutions to crises around the world. But dig a little deeper, and you'll find many more points of division. Pope Francis has strongly condemned the Trump administration's decision to back away from the Paris Agreement on climate change. He's also expressed misgivings about Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, his refugee policies, and he even questioned whether Trump was truly pro-life after announcing an end to the DACA protections for immigrant children in the United States. 
and voters in Spanish Catalonia have re-elected pro-independence lawmakers to lead their regional parliament, signaling that a high-stakes push to break away from Spain and form a new country could be far from over. The plan to hold new elections this week was devised by Spain's Prime Minister, Mariano Rajoy, who feuded bitterly with Catalan independence leaders and hoped new elections would see unionist parties seize control. Thursday's vote is a win for exiled Catalan leader Carles Puigdemont, who fled to Belgium after being threatened with arrest for organizing an October referendum that saw an overwhelming majority of voters back independence. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Hey, thank you for accompanying us uh, back to the chef's table here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Now, if you'll uh, scroll down to the bottom of your menu, the virtual menu in which you are uh, listening to this show right now, <laughs> uh, scroll down to the bottom of our homepage, which is at netroosradio.com, which we will call the menu for today. You notice the chat room link on the right. Um, do contact us. You can uh, pretty much contact us in real life time. Kelly, uh, rowing girl, doesn't monitor it 24 hours a day, but she's on it quite frequently and responds uh, uh, right away. And then uh, to the leftish of the chat room link there at the bottom of the homepage are the contribute donate buttons. And that, of course, is how we pay the bills, and we cannot do that without you. Thank you for your generosity. And you can con contact me at Justice Putnam on Twitter, and I'm also Justice Putnam on Daily Co's. So a couple of ways if you'd like to contact me, uh, do that in those two platforms. And uh, uh, what else? Oh, pods. Yes, I am working diligently to make sure that I have a platform in place and it'll probably be after the first of the year, which I guess since uh, time is the way it is, it's going to be next week. So I better get on it. Uh, I have them in an archive folder, and it might take a little bit of time to catch up, but they will become available ASAP. All right, uh, let's take a look at weather from around the world, starting here along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the West Coast. It is currently 39 degrees. We are slated to go to a high of 51. It may be that's the case. It has been raining, though uh, we only have a small chance of rain. It seems like 100% to me. And then tonight, we are supposed to have a small chance of rain, but we're, we're having a small chance of rain right now, so it may be 100% tonight, too. Who knows? Though uh, tomorrow, we have a higher chance of rain. With a high tomorrow, 52, we'll have a low tonight of 40. Uh, air quality is only moderate at 54 parts per million, which is, uh, you know, not, not good for those with breathing problems. Pressure is at 30.3 inches. Visibility is down to 5 miles. Because humidity is 92%. Because to me, it's raining. I think that's 100%. Okay, so weather from the rest of around the world is brought to you by people who have purchased their own personal weather stations. And these people live around the world. London is 38 degrees and clear. Uh, uh, Paris is 43 degrees with rain and a wind advisory that may shut down infrastructure. Rome has the same wind advisory. They are at 53 degrees in rain. Kiev is 37 with fog. Kabul is 34 and clear. Hong Kong, 67 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 37 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 66 and clear. San Francisco, California is 47 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 20 degrees and mostly cloudy. And uh, that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And uh, these people live around the world. 
Okay, a little addendum to the weather here that I should mention also. Uh, Manhattan in New York, New York proper. That is New York, New York proper. Uh, they do have a uh, zero wind chill advisory tonight into Thursday morning. Uh, wind chill values between zero and five below. So they tell you if you must venture out tonight, make sure to dress appropriately. And uh, where I come from, we tell people, you know, stay inside. You got to chop wood to, uh, you know, get warm. Do that. But get back inside. Uh, I know from uh, personal experience, a gin martini does not really warm you up. In fact, alcohol, by its very property, uh, will chill you. So be careful. Okay, so <laughs> let's see. The Republican tax scam. I'm sure that somebody's gotten that uh, that trademarked and copyrighted already. I, I, I'm i a little slow on the trigger on some of these things, but I like it. It should be trademarked. This is by Jeff Bryant from the Education Opportunity Network. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos has insisted that her lifelong support for school vouchers and other forms of school privatization does not mean the Trump administration will mandate these school choice policies, but her Republican friends in Congress put into their tax plan new provisions that will have essentially the same impact as a federally supported school voucher program and will redirect millions of dollars from public treasuries to private schools. Well, when you have a tax scam bill written by a lobbyist, what do you expect? And I'm not kidding. They wrote it. These... These representatives didn't write this bill. They don't know how. Republicans and DeVos know that school vouchers are generally unpopular with voters and have been voted down to the ballot box every time they've been atten attempted through referendum. So why not hide it in a giant tax scam bill that no one is able to read until now after its, uh, you know, passage? Nice. I don't know. Maybe next time they'll do it in the original Cyrillic. Betsy DeVos and her husband blew millions in funding. I think that's in dollars. Could have been rubles, but I think in this case it's dollars. In an attempt to pass school voucher measures in their home state of Michigan, only to see it go down to defeat. So if you can't win at the ballot box, that's right, take over the government. That's what they tell you. Run for office, then, if you're so smarty, smarty pants. Yeah, well, nevertheless, Congress, with DeVos's blessing, is ramping up federal support for vouchers, with the only difference being, whereas vouchers distribute public education funds directly to parents to pay for private schools, these new schemes bring K-12 through school vouchers in through the back door using the tax code. <laughs> That way, it can be skimmed off the top. And people are paying directly. I mean, come on. What do you think this is? Socialism? Just giving these people money to go pay a private school? One voucher-like scheme Republicans added to the tax code allows parents who have tax-free 529 college savings accounts to use that money, up to 10000 a year per child, to pay for private K-12 through school expenses, including tuition at religious schools. Because we're trying to decrease the amount of college graduates. Otherwise, uh, we'll be too exceptional in the world. We have to come down to the standards of, I don't know, Russia. Now, that's not to say that their education system is, is corrupt and, and whatnot. But... Uh, but it is run by oligarchs, so that it, you know, there is that. Uh, Russian scientists actually are quite advanced, so who am I? But I'm just saying that uh, when you're deconstructing the administrative state, as I've said before, this is one way. This gives wealthy families, many who can afford all private school tuition, an option to have tax-free distributions to pay for K through 12 expenses expenses every year too. Jeez, I don't know. Get them into a prep school right from kindergarten. K 
Catherine Flynn at Forbes explains how this would work in a high tax state like New York. We're up to $10,000 in 529 contributions is deductible from taxable income. In other words, this money doesn't go to the public schools ever. Oh, they're going to call the charter schools public, but when they call the principal the CEO of the school, I think we're in whole different territory here. It doesn't sound to me to be like the academy. So wealthy parents get a double dipping effect on their tax savings from this 529 extension. The rest of us bear the full tax burden of funding public schools for the vast majority of the children. And more funds that could have gone to paying for public schools get redirected to private schools instead, just like with vouchers. Well, I don't know. Seems like a feature, not a bug to me. If you're trying to shrink government down to the size when you where you can drown it in a bathtub and then force it to write in Cyrillic, you got to put them through private schools. Public schools can't handle that. They're going to teach things like American ideals. Those days are over. The loophole takes advantage of the education tax credit program set up in many states. Education tax credit programs use a third party, often called a scholarship granting organization, that is set up as a nonprofit by the state or by financial groups connected to the private school industry. Tax credits are issued by the state to private individuals, businesses, or corporations that make donations to the SGO. The money from the SGO from those donations is then distributed to selected parents to use for private school tuition. Sounds like they had almost like a merit-based system. Let's throw that out. Yeah. Because we don't want poor people in our private schools. Don't you know? No one is ever brought up by poor people. They're only brought down. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That poor person can, you know, feel a sense of being lifted up. But, uh, you know, I really don't want a poor person to think that they got, you know, a little bit too much on the ball there. Otherwise, uh, you know, we might have pink flamingos in the front yard. Jeez, that's abhorrent. It is, actually. Call me, call me a coastal elite. And that's where you see, that's where you mostly see the pink, plastic pink flamingos. Is in, you know, the, the trappings of the coastal elite. What Republicans did in their tax plan incentivizes more wealthy people to take advantage of this scheme. By capping state and local tax deductions to $10,000, the new tax legislation dramatically increases the attractiveness of giving to education tax credit programs. Okay. It bears mentioning that these backdoor methods for funding school vouchers through the federal tax code not only rob public education of much-needed funds, they also lead generally to bad education results, which is also a feature, not a bug. You don't want a bunch of poor people thinking that they're too smart. Especially when you've had a bunch of, like, wealthy people who've been bred for so many generations. You know, their intellectual capacity gets a little capped. And uh, I, I think I think the best example of that would be uh, Michael Flynn's son. You know what they say: intelligence does jump a generation, sometimes a couple. School vouchers have generally lo- a lousy track record in benefiting individual students and creating systemic improvement. Recent studies conducted in Indiana, Louisiana, Ohio, and Washington D.C found students who use voucher programs are more apt to exhibit declines in academic achievement. Other studies in Indiana and Louisiana found the initial dips in achievement were temporary, and students tended to catch up to their public school peers. Well, of course, they gotta. But other studies of long-standing voucher programs have found they also pose serious risks to public education systems, including increased school segregation, additional administrative costs, more reliance on inexperienced teachers, and a greater likelihood students who are the most costly and difficult to to educate will be turned away 
are pushed out by private schools that are not obligated to serve all students. You can't have a bunch of, like, I don't know, kids in wheelchairs gumming up the works. I don't know. You got to have, like, uh, you know, pet dogs coming in here leading blind students. We can't have that. So on balance, there's simply no good argument for throwing new money in program administration at something like school vouchers that have little to no prospect of producing widespread higher achievement, but considerable risks of introducing negative results. What is also alarming is that vouchers and voucher-like schemes are, are eroding the nation's historical separation between, between church and state and providing public funding of religious education that indoctrinates students in ideological, ahistorical, and non-factual curriculum underwritten by religiously fundamentalist institutions. Yeah. Now that uh, Republicans are the ones leading this bait-and-switch scheme, however, there is an additional irony to the debate when the supposed upholders of states' rights are the ones pushing federal incentives. Betsy DeVos's current response to this situation is to put on her radar screen even more efforts to push school vouchers into federal statutes. And this time, with the back door to school vouchers now wide open, we should take her at her word. All right, last course up here at the uh, chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is brought to you by David Edwards from Raw Story. I, I've often pondered that uh, Trump learned American civics by that crash course at the Kremlin that the FSB teaches to recruits and new Russian assets and maybe even useful idiots. Now, I've been following Trump for a long time. Way back, way back, because he epitomized everything that, well, uh, my punk sensibilities consider to be insensible. And we used to make the joke back then that uh, it was as if he learned American civics from something not in America. And uh, this uh, latest complaint, I think, uh, belies that uh, that notion, I think, is that, or I'm sorry, emblematic of that notion that maybe he did learn American civics in a Kremlin-backed uh, crash course. All right, Donald Trump's difficult relationship with former Senator Jeff Sessions reportedly became more strained after Republicans lost the Senate seat that he vacated to accept the job of U.S. Attorney General for the Trump administration. The working relationship between Trump and the Attorney General began to crumble soon after Sessions announced early in 2017 that he would recuse himself from the investigation into Russia's interference in the U.S. election. According to an AP report that was published yesterday, the relationship became further frayed in July when FBI agents raided the home of Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign ma manager. Privately, he discussed firing sessions, but was met with a wave of resistance from his advisors, the AP reported. Some warned it would worsen the Russia probe, while Bannon told the president it would hurt with his base supporters who love Sessions' tough-on-crime approach. And I would also add, uh, kicking black and brown people as much as they can, and Sessions gives them, gives them sucker. And although the report notes that Chief of Staff John Kelly tried to repair the relationship, it continued to sour after Republican candidate Roy Moore lost the race for the Senate seat that was vacated by Sessions. But the rift between Trump and Sessions still has not healed. Recently, Trump bemoaned, uh, bemoaned the Republicans' loss in a special election in Alabama and in part blamed Sessions, the AP wrote, whose departure from the Senate to head the Justice Department necessitated the election. What an idiot. And useful, too. Compliant, useful idiot. The best kind to do what they want to do. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast uh, period for today in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But we will have the cafe cleaned and spiffed up for tomorrow for Metro uh, Shrimp and Grits Thursday. Sounds spicy. So we hope you show up then. Uh, stay tuned uh, for the rest of the day and 24-7, uh, 365 to Netroots Radio. There's always some great content. So uh, we will visit with you tomorrow. 
in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coël. Je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golfe clair. T'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 